Well, welcome to the first session of the morning. Today we'll be talking about finding the needle in the haystack, in the content haystack, when you're looking for answers in content and have to find information in a lot of other information that exists out there. My name is Udi Hershkovich. I'm the business development manager for Amazon Translate, one of our AI services at AWS. With me today is Niranjan Hira, our uh, solution architect for artificial intelligence. And later we'll have a deep dive with uh, Girish Arunagiri uh, from FINRA. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from them. And we'll get started. So what we're going to talk about today is really understanding, first of all, what those growing haystacks are. Uh, what is all these different content types or content repositories that we're trying to look for information in. Then we're going to dive a little deeper and understand how can we use AI in order to find the information we seek. Run through some examples of companies that are using AI already to identify or find the information they're looking for uh, across various use cases. And then, as I mentioned, a deep dive with FINRA, uh, an e-discovery use case looking at how we investigate financial violations. To start with, I'd like to walk you through some examples of haystacks. Um, first one is what I call deep archives. This is information that is organized, fairly curated. You can think of academic research documents or uh, product descriptions on a retail website or media libraries. This, this type of, uh, of, of archive or repository um, is usually curated and organized in some way. If you think of a media library, uh, you think of a catalog, right? With uh, descriptions of every media asset, for example, every video, there's a description, there's associated keywords, additional information that helps you find what you're looking for. But even then, it is still pretty challenging when you run a search to find exactly what it is that you're looking for. Just think of uh, searching for cat videos on YouTube, um, or searching for that movie that Cher was dressed as, uh, as a fish in. Either you find too much or too little, and in many cases you don't find exactly what you're looking for. By the way, the cat videos are time well spent. Another example, is enterprise knowledge. So across the organization, any organization, the enterprise, there's a lot of information that's available for employees to be able to do their jobs better, right? This is everything from uh, HR, how-tos, to IT, um, uh, technical documentation, to legal documents like NDAs that we need to fill out and sign. Um, even though this is also curated content, IDC shows that 44% of the time spent searching for that information actually ends up without finding the information that we need. This leads to a cost of about $5,700 per knowledge uh, uh, employee per year spent or wasted. That's a lot of money when you aggregate it together. Um, show of hands. Who here was looking for some information? For example, how do I expense my reports going to reInvent in Vegas this week or any other type of information in the course of the last week and could not find or took a very long time to find what they were looking for? Show of hands. Right. It's a familiar thing, right? We all, we all do that all the time. We waste our time. Another interesting use case is e-discovery. Now, e-discovery uh, in financial services or in legal is a, is a situation where uh, parties to a dispute, maybe a litigation or investigation, need to share information with each other um, and look for something, some needle, some evidence, right, in litigation, for example. It's also uh, the case where uh, regulated bodies need to regularly share information with government agencies in an audit or investigation, or government agencies that need to share information with the public, for example, under the, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, public information requests. 
These um, information custodians need to share a lot of information, in many cases against their will or against their interest, and so what they, happens is that they dump an enormous amount of information onto the other side, sometimes millions or tens of millions of documents, and this is a unique case because uh, unlike deep archives or enterprise knowledge, um, this is not really curated content. These are not organized libraries or catalogs, no metadata, usually lots of emails, lots of documents in many languages, many formats, many modalities, and you need to find what you're looking for, and in many cases, you don't even know what it is that you're really looking for, right? So, for example, um, in one case, a company shared about 10 million emails with another company, and then uh, obviously using uh, false names. Um, Joe sends an email to Jane saying, I bought you 15,000 candles for your birthday. And within a certain time frame, Jane sends another email to Marie, maybe even in a different language, saying, um, John only got you 15,000 of the shares you asked and not the full 30,000. Connecting those dots in 10 million emails and figuring out that now Marie is implicated in a candle scandal is not that easy. How do we do that? We'll see in a minute. Another good example, and this is the last one uh, I'll go through of a haystack, although there are many others, is in customer support. Customer support tend to be very highly curated information, right? FAQs, technical documentation, user guides. But still, when we're seeking an answer to a question, how often do we find it? How many times, and this happens to me a lot, so I want to see show of hands again. I will wake you up a little bit Monday morning here. Um, how many times did a customer of yours told you after you talked to them or presented something, hey, send me this presentation. I need your presentation in order to remember what you told me, even though they can just as easily find information on page 457 of your technical manual. Right? Happens a lot. So these are some of the stacks that we're looking at. I'm going to skip over this for a second. And let's talk about the problem. So what is the problem here? Well, first of all, information exists today in a lot of unreadable formats. Everything from rich media, could be videos, audio, to scan documents, to images, text and images, um, multilingual content. Did you realize there are 6,000 spoken languages on Earth today? Yeah. Incredible. Um, when somebody's collecting content or when an enterprise has a knowledge repository or when we want to serve our customers and definitely in e-discovery use cases, there's an enormous amount of content that is very difficult to even read through or search through um, as a first step. And then the bigger problem on top of that is that a lot of it is unstructured. And unstructured basically means is that you don't have indicators into placeholders. There's a lot of information in there that may be viable in all sorts of forms, and there is no way to access it. So, we put together a reference architecture, a generic reference architecture, I should say, that um, goes through several steps, and there are many permutations to this reference architecture, and we'll see some of them today that goes through several steps in order to take those content repositories, those haystacks, and extract the relevant information from them and organize them in a way that becomes useful, where you can find your needles. And one of the uh, interesting um, points that are less relevant to our AI use case here, but an interesting thing that keeps coming up with a lot of our customers is that they tell us that one of their biggest challenges in finding information in the haystacks is getting the haystacks in the first place. Putting them somewhere, creating a lake, um, putting them somewhere that is cost efficient, that is uh, manageable, that is secure. Um, seems obvious, but that's point number one. So we use a, uh, an Amazon S3 bucket here to create 
a data lake where you can take advantage of the automated life cycle management where information becomes stale and older and less relevant. It can automatically be moved over to infrequent access or, or glacier deeper and deeper, deeper and cheaper storage, I should say. Um, and also in terms of processing cost. Using a serverless architecture, using AWS Lambda functions here, we're able to uh, process information or introduce cost of processing information only when information is actually being ingested and processed, only when it actually creates any value and not long-term kind of licensing uh, or, or spending money on servers that sit most of the time idle if you're looking at e-discovery use cases. And where we start using our AI services is in what I call the first step is normalization. We mentioned there are a lot of different formats of information, right? If we think of any discovery use case or knowledge repositories in an enterprise, we have videos, we have training videos and manuals, we have wikis, presentations, um, scanned documents from various events, and more. Here we use AI services, language and speech services, in order to extract the text, step one, right? We want to create um, a ground truth, monolingual, textual lake to start analyzing. So the first step, uh, we use services such as Amazon TextRack, which is an intelligent OCR that can also identify uh, not just extract text from images, but identify tabular formats, uh, form structures, uh, retain the relationships within, tabu uh, uh, within tables and forms, uh, making it more easy for the upcoming analysis. Uh, Amazon Transcribe, which is our speech-to-text uh, service, uh, that can identify up to five uh, simultaneous speakers if we're looking at phone records. Um, and uh, covers more than 30 languages as a source, uh, source speech. Amazon Translate, which is a neural machine translation service at AWS, uh, covers over 50 languages. Uh, in a recent case, uh, we did a proof of concept. Uh, we had to uh, address an investigation of uh, over 100 different languages, actually 111 different languages from a single company. Um, translation, uh, when you send information to a foreign reviewer or a translator, cost can stagger very, very quickly. Once we normalized all this text, and this can also include recognition as a way of labeling images and videos and, and more and more. Once we normalized all this text, now what we have is actually text that represents all this information. And now we can start applying analytics. Now we can apply NLP, natural language processing, using Amazon Comprehend. Amazon Comprehend uh, is our NLP service that is able to categorize, classify uh, documents or uh, snippets of text based on their context, and is also able to identify and extract key entities and phrases from unstructured text. Um, for categorization, there's an option of using custom classifications. Uh, custom classifications, uh, for example, again, I'll, I'll keep going to the e-discovery use cases, uh, being able to say that this document is associated with a board, uh, a board discussion or an executive meeting, right, uh, compared to maybe employee communication. And the key entities that we can identify cover people and places, time frames, which are very important, um, and, and more, and can also be customized to identify specific types of entities, like uh, product codes, to identify products as a group, right, as an entity. Once we've extracted all this information from text, now we can finally map it out, right? Um, mapping it out basically means, for example, using Amazon Elasticsearch service in order to create an index that you can search in. Now, when we're looking for Joe and Jane, and maybe Marie, if we're, uh, if we're aware of her dealings, um, we're able to start searching for these people as well as for specific measurements, like the number of shares that they traded and other things. But we don't always know what we're looking for. 
And here we use Amazon Neptune, a graph database that allows us to identify relationships and their intensity. So when we throw 10 million emails at this workflow and we end up with a lot of different entities and phrases that are mapped out, um, the opportunity here is to see who Jane is communicating with in order to see who is maybe related on a particular topic and then find that there's a lot of communication over a certain period of time between Jane and Marie, right? It's applicable in the case of media libraries when you're looking for uh, relationships between uh, movies, for example. Show me all the movies that Martin Scorsese directed within a certain time frame. Right? All those relationships are really, really important, both to building a case and understanding the relationship between information. All the information related for customer support around a particular product, like Amazon Translate. Right? It may be in all sorts of forms and different documents across the organization. I want to link them all together. The graph will actually show me, uh, based on the entity Translate, which will be identified um, as a thing, uh, maybe even as an organization sometimes. Uh, but as a custom, it can be a uh, custom entity can be identified as an AWS service. Um, it will show me all the different references and all the documents that may be relevant. And maybe sometimes what you find is documents that may not have identified entities. They are not related to Amazon Translate, but somehow they show a lot of similarities with the document that is. So graph database, very useful to identify the relationships between different documents and uh, some that we may not be aware of. And finally, using Amazon SageMaker, we can build custom models, custom machine learning models that allow us to um, do more identified uh, known relationships. Uh, known relationships meaning when you have a lot of uh, structured data that you can use in order to train your own custom model and look for things specific that may be knowns within the unknown lake of unstructured data. And, and we'll have uh, our friends at FINRA show us uh, an example of two of that. So this is essentially a generic workflow, a reference architecture that can have many permutations. And in some cases, um, we build solution, custom solutions for a particular use case that it serves as a template, essentially. A place to start um, where you can um, click to start using and goes all the way from video to an indexed uh, library. And then you can continue and, and uh, improve on, change, add, uh, rather than start from scratch. I want to hand it over to Hira for a second uh, to give us a little bit more in-depth. Thanks, Udi. Can I have the clicker? So um, if you see this architecture, and if I asked you guys to uh, put these services together in this exact same way, it'll probably take you at least 20, 30 minutes to sort of identify the services you want to work with. And I've never worked with a single architect who said, yep, that looks exactly the way I'd want to do it. I want to do this this way right now. Right? Well, most people look at these architectures and say, yeah, that's great, but for my use case, I need to do blah, whatever blah might be. Whether that's I have a custom model for relationship extraction, whether it's because I want to reduce my search to a subset of languages, whether it's because I've got an augmented data set somewhere else. Right? So the idea is that with these reference architectures, we often find customers who say, I'd like to use mostly this, right? but I'd like to add this or take away this other thing, right? Um, if you were doing this for call center analysis, for example, uh, if you were looking at transcripts or phone call recordings, you'd want to do things a little differently. You'd, you'd want to see trends in the data set that are more visualization of how many people called for this reason. So yesterday, many of us took flights. How many people called because the flights were delayed? And the real question that I have for the airlines is, for example, did they know that there was a conference that people were going to based solely on the analysis of those contact logs, right? So those are the kinds of things that often wind up changing these architectures. So what we've done with these uh, AWS solutions, and hence, show of hands, how many people have actually looked at an AWS solution before? 
So there's a special part of the website where we've, we've put these solutions out there. Hopefully you find them uh, helpful because there are teams of people who actually take a lot of time to put together some of the best practices. You know, how do you handle authentication? How do you put in some of the best practices with respect to security and encryption and, uh, in terms of your data, as well as how to reasonably put these services together. Um, and ideally, you essentially take an afternoon to do something that would often take you weeks, right? So the point is, you start with this CloudFormation template, you spin it up, and once it's up, you say, aha, I like this, but I don't like that. I like Elasticsearch, but I want to use a, an API front end to it. You know, those are the kinds of things that people, like I said, would often do. So there is a media analysis solution template um, that is available that essentially implements a lot of this. So I'd urge you to go take a look at it. But now let's talk about what customers do um, with some of these services, right? So we'll take a couple of quick examples, and then, um, then we'll ask Gears to come over and talk to the, us about their story with FINRA. Um, Alfresco is one of our partners who found value in Textract. So if you think about document databases, if you think about being able to search and collaborate with, how many people have worked with Alfresco before? So it's a great content management tool, right? So the whole point is that uh, if you're looking at those kind of documents, often you wind up with, oh, here's a PDF that looks suspiciously like something that I could find useful, but there doesn't actually happen to be text. It's a picture of text, right? And so what Alfresco did is that they've actually built connectors not just for TextTrack, but for some of the other services as well to be able to ingest documents and make that searchable as part of the software. Um, another example with uh, face recognition. So again, face recognition is a challenging space and finding reasonable examples of where it's successful uh, is sometimes hard to do because there are boundaries about what you should and should not do, right? So in this case, uh, there, was, there was a tool that was created um, called Traffic Jam Face Search. Uh, Marin's Analytics created this tool to essentially help find children that we knew uh, or they knew, I should say. Law enforcement was able to then detect that these are children that they were looking for because they were likely to be, uh, they were likely to be found in these random searches rather than looking at these records. So we know that children are more likely to be trafficked at certain ages, and that's where this kind of tool is extremely helpful. So, um, Udi, can you tell us a little bit about Lexby? Sure. So Lexby, another good example. Um, this is in legal e-discovery. Lexby um, is an e-discovery independent software vendor, or ISV, um, that caters to boutique law firms and corporate legal teams. And what they've identified over the years is that there is, with globalization, there is a uh, growth of cross-border litigation um, or global enterprises uh, that are being sued and information is required from many different custodians, information custodians from uh, around, the, around the globe. And so in order to mitigate uh, the, the challenges of sending information out for foreign review, never knowing when it's actually going to come back and, and complicating the process, not to mention doubling the cost, um, they've introduced Amazon Translate as a as a means of expediting that normalization step in the workflow, being able to say, hey, we need to get to, or we can get to quickly to a ground truth. Um, and with all these examples, um, with, uh, with Marinus Analytics, with Lexby, um, with uh, many more, the process is the same. There is a haystack of unstructured content. There is normalization that needs to happen, which happens very well with AI. There is a search for needles or evidence, shreds of evidence within the text in key entities and classifications. And finally, the tools in order to run those searches and find what we're looking for, despite the fact that we started with a very high Haystack. To provide a great deep dive and example, I'd like to call up to the stage Girish from FINRA, the Director of Technology, who will be walking us through an e-discovery use case. Girish. The clicker. The clicker. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. And hello, everyone. 
My name is Girish Arunagiri. I am uh, a product manager supporting the analytics efforts for FINRA's exam program. FINRA, under the supervision of the SEC, plays a critical role in the American financial system, specifically when it comes to the securities market. Our mission is investor protection and market integrity. And what I have here is an outline on how we are able to fulfill our mission. We write and enforce rules that govern the ethical activities of all US-based broker dealers and the brokers that work at those firms. We examine firms for uh, their compliance with the rules that we write. We protect investors by fostering a fair and transparent securities market. And most importantly, we educate investors on a broad variety of financial topics electronically, in print, and in person. For those of you here at uh, reInvent this week, you've probably heard of FINRA in the context of a big data processor. Yes, we process about as much as 135 billion records on a nightly basis. These are the trades, the orders that go through the exchanges, the equity orders and the options orders that go through the exchanges on a nightly basis. We collect over 650,000, uh, we collect um, profile and registration information on over 650,000 brokers on a recurring basis. And on top of a lot of other data sets that we collect, um, one of the key things that we collect is um, financial information on either a monthly or a quarterly basis from all the member firms. An example for a member firm would be, for those of us here in the States um, that has a retirement plan, a 401k plan, as we call it. For those of us in the room that have children, we have um, education plans, the 529 plans. You probably have them with um, Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or T. Rowe Price. The three firms that I just mentioned are FINRA's members, all right? And in addition to the recurring data sets that we collect, um, at exam time, we collect emails, trade transactions, stock positions, um, written supervisory procedures, and a number of other data sets. All of this data and a vast majority of the processing that goes along with it reside on Amazon S3, 100%, 100% built on Amazon. As you can probably tell, we have one of the largest data lakes uh, with the most multifaceted bodies of securities information all stored in one place. With the vast amount of data that we need to assess or our exam staff need to assess, technology plays a central role in identifying or distinguishing between what is honorable, what is questionable, and what is downright improper business activities. One such um, setting in which FINRA examiners are able to make the differentiation is as a part of a FINRA annual exam program. What is an exam? For those of us, I mean, for, for, the, for a common man, an exam would be an audit of your tax filings from last year or two years ago. So when a, FINRA, FINRA, when a FINRA exam takes place, it's essentially an audit of the books and records of the firm that is a member of ours. At exam, um, so when a, when a member firm is selected for an exam, the first thing that happens is we make an announcement, call the firm and say, all right, we are gonna be looking at these three business lines for a given amount of time. And for us to be able to uh, do that exam, we need data sets to sample from you. So that is where we make a, a request for a number of data sets. One of the key data sets that we uh, request is um, unstructured data, email, and a number of other data sets that we already saw that reside on the data lake. All of this data have to be analyzed individually, in relation to each other, and in relation to all of the data that reside um, on our data lake. 
for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the email content analysis, some of which Udi alluded to, and talk about how Amazon's AI services, such as Amazon SageMaker, Amazon TextTrack, and Amazon Comprehend were able to help us really bring unstructured data set and structured data sets together. Look at it this way, right? You've got unstructured data on one side of the river, you have structured data on the other side of the river, and we are gonna look at how Amazon's AI services is able to build a bridge between these two data sets. And I'll walk you through that. But before we get into the specifics of it, let's take a look at what email content analysis is about today. In one of the emails that we, um, in one of the exams that we recently um, helped with, um, helped our exam staff with, we had north of a million emails that we obtained from the firm on just 20 custodians. A custodian is essentially my email inbox, Hira's, and Udi's. That's three custodians. So you take that 20 custodians, you've got a million emails that we obtained from the firm for about a 12-month period. That is it. You're talking really large data set there from a single firm um, for a very short amount of time. We have to analyze, or our exam staff have to analyze all of this data in a matter of weeks. You've got a handful of examiners trying to analyze all of this data in a matter of weeks. That's where the time sensitivity comes in. Complex business activities, correspondences about complex business activities need to be analyzed in a matter of weeks. If there was any uh, trend analysis, it was all manual, let's be honest. Um, it was about Really, we couldn't really take um, entities out of the unstructured data content and overlay them with other structured data where we are super good with um, you know, identifying patterns. We weren't able to do that with the email data content because there was really no, nothing that we could take from the emails to connect to the structured data sets. Limited trend analysis. And with the unknown data coming in, as you, uh, you alluded to with uh, respect to e-discovery, our exam staff go in with, let's say, preconceived notions or, or predetermined keywords. They probably picked up a couple of names from some of their other analysis at the firm. They probably uh, know a few tickers that they need to look up through the emails, like how we would search through our um, you know, Outlook or uh, our Gmail account. And that inherently leads to a selection bias because they are starting off with a known point that they know perhaps not necessarily looking at all the other stuff that may be in the data set. So that inherently leads to a selection bias. But things are changing at FINRA though. And for that, let me take you back to the data lake. The emails reside in the data lake, the unstructured data. And we have to take the body of emails, the corpus of emails, and subject them through a process called entity extraction to essentially start you know, laying those bricks or building the bricks, making those bricks that would make the bridge, um, such as ticker symbols, um, account numbers, QCIPs, uh, people's names, and a few other entities that we need to pull from the emails. All right? So <clears throat> although it may sound complex, it's really a simple three-step process. In step one, we take the metadata from the emails. Metadata is really who is the sender, who is the receiver, who was copied, who was blind copied, what time was it sent, what date. All of the stuff that go, usually goes on in the email header. We take the metadata from the emails, we move it over to an Amazon RDS. In our case, we use PostgreSQL. And once we get that done, what we do is in step two, we take the corpus, or the, the bodies of the email, the corpus of the email, and using models that run on Amazon SageMaker, um, our data scientist here, Shavan is with me here, um, we, we run models on SageMaker that essentially uh, uh, reduces noise in the emails. So what is noise? Noise is anything that 
has, or any emails that have no regulatory oversight significance. So in the body of one million emails that, um, that I quoted as an example, we were able to bring it down to a really small subset because what we did was we got rid of all the noise. An example for, a few examples for noise would be Amazon purchase confirmations, the lunch dates, the happy hour, the LinkedIn alerts, the, uh, the Google alerts. All of this is noise. It has nothing to do with a firm's trading activity. So we get that out of the way, and what comes out of this distillation process is what we call as emails of interest. One would think, all right, now we have the emails of interest, now let's push all this through um, the next service because we're ready to uh, start extracting entities. But let's think through this a little bit. What we did was, in step two, we took just the bodies of the emails. There are attachments for the emails. We take the attachments, any attachments that are either in a PDF format or in an image format, and we take them and subject them through uh, Amazon Textract to extract any text that are either in um, you know, uh, uh, sentences, paragraphs, regular text, text that is in a tabular form, and any text that are on the images. We take the, um, the output of step three, we combine that with the output from step two, and we send it through Amazon Comprehend to begin the process of entity extraction. Out of the box, Amazon Comprehend was able to extract entities such as people's names, organization names, addresses, geographic locations, and a number of other entities that are probably common in, uh, between us and the retail market. Using a bit of ingenuity and um, using the parts of speech that is supported by Amazon Comprehend, we were able to overlay a master list of um, security symbols that we maintain at Finder onto the body of emails, on the, on, the, on, the, on the emails of interest, and extract symbols from the bodies of text. So you're really looking at AMZN or you're looking at AAPL being pulled out of the corpus. And using custom models that run on Comprehend, again, something that um, Udi alluded to, we were able to extract entities that are very specific to our domain. Let me give you an example. A QSIP. A QSIP is a nine character uh, string, ident a common identifier that is, as that is assigned to any security that is traded in an exchange. So we were able to build a custom model where the machine was able to essentially separate what a QSIP is versus what an account number, a, a nine-digit account number is. I mean, for those of us who have a brokerage account, we, if you look at your account numbers, they're usually eight, nine characters long. So there was no confusion when the machine got in and said, okay, this set of, this set of, account, this set of strings is QSIP, this set is um, account numbers. All right? So what we've gone through is entity extraction. So we have a number of entities that, that, are, that, that will support us to start building that bridge. Once we have the entities extracted, we do two things. We take a copy of the entities, we copy it over to the data lake, we take another copy of the um, entities that are extracted, we mo move it over to the RDS, and once we have the data, all the data, the metadata and the extracted entities and the emails in the RDS, we're able to create analytics with an eye towards integration of unstructured data set, which is this set of emails, with other structured data content like um, the trades that were triggered um, in the market at that point in time. Let me give you a couple of examples which will help uh, you know, tell the story better. First example, in the exam that we supported, we were able to identify a group of reps, a group of brokers, that were heavily selling a specific set of securities down to a specific customer demographic, we were able to take the communications from the email and tie that down to their trade records going back six, eight months in time. So you have the emails where they're talking about it, and you have the trades that were going off 
around the same time or at the same time um, going back in time. Another example is another set of, another group of individuals who work at the firm were heavily, um, uh, traf um, not a good word, um, were heavily selling or heavily involved in pushing a complex financial instrument to a different set of customer demographics, right? All right, so now that we've gone through the architecture and all of that, all of this is good, but let's take a, a quick exam, um, a super sample output here, right, at a super high level. What I have here on the top left of the slide is an email that obviously I made up to save myself some, some conversations with the lawyers back in the office. Um, so this picture uh, depicts where we're able to take an email, we run it through Amazon's AI services, it highlights people's names, it's uh, Verstappen, Sebi, and uh, Lewis for, for, for the Formula One fans that are in the room, yes. I put the slide together right after the Brazilian Grand Prix, which was great to watch. We, it, the, the AI services uh, helps extract the names, it ha extracts symbols, QSIPs, and customer account numbers. Once all of these entities are extracted, we are then able to tie this email, quite literally, with the financial news down to a date, time that is available in the public domain. We are able to tie this email with market activity of the specific QSIPs or symbols that are mentioned in the email. So it talks about so let's talk about it, right? You, you have a symbol that is being you know, talked about in an email. We can take that and we can tie it down to the price movement in the market. Is it going up? Is it going down? What is the capitalization at that time? So on and so forth. So we're able to do that together. And last one is pulling any customer names out, we are able to tie that with the customer account statements, your statements, folks are in the room, the brokerage statements that you receive at the end of every month. We get a copy of that when we need it, so we're able to tie this information down to a customer statement, and once we are able to do this, we are able to present one holistic view to our exam staff about the firm's business activities, not just about what is in the emails, but also with their trade transactions, the stock records, and all that. So if you go back to my uh, analogy about the bridge, this is where we are now tying, or, or laying the bricks and building the bridge between the two data sets, the unstructured data and the structured data, and present on holistic view to our business. All of this is really good, right? I mean, great stuff. But why did we do this? Previously buried information, super easy access. They were all siloed. We brought them together. In the exam that I'm using as an example here, we were able to reduce the um, review time of emails, a million emails, by about 60%. As one of our execs put it, we were able to uh, reduce it from weeks down to a few clicks. And the last one is, goes without saying, an increase in our regulatory effectiveness. And with that, I am now going to hand this back over to Udi. Thank you so much. A fantastic example of when you need to find something which is hard to find. You don't necessarily know what you're looking for, but you're able to connect the dots between a lot of unstructured content that is being thrown at you uh, or available. Whether you are in customer support, you need to provide access to your enterprise customers, internal or external, to information whether you have large libraries of information or archives that you need to monetize, or whether you're looking for information such as building applications for e-discovery or for any use case where needles need to be found in very large haystacks. The um, example we've provided as a um, generic um, workflow or reference architecture can be applied through our uh, existing solutions or uh, through um, building your own. And with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. We have, uh, we left 15 minutes for Q&A, which is awesome. There are a couple of mics, at least one, uh, circulating, and there, there's a microphones on two sides. 
of the aisles. So if anybody has questions, I invite uh, Hira um, and Girish to join me on stage, and we'll be happy to take them.